Welcome to Adjusted Reality, a podcast series trusted by the adjusted and brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress, where we learn from athletes, celebrities, influencers, and healthcare professionals about how to optimize health in a fun, relatable way. Join me, Dr. Sherry McAllister, as I speak with author, chiropractor, and retired Army Ranger, Dr. Tony Brooks. After enlisting in the U.S. Army in 2003 at the age of 21, Dr. Tony Brooks attended and graduated infantry and airborne school, followed by the four-week Ranger indoctrination program. Officially checking in to the second Ranger Battalion in Fort Lewis, Washington. In September 2004, he deployed to Eastern Afghanistan in April 2005, based at Bagram Airfield. His first mission was Operation Red Wings 2. Tony subsequently deployed to the Ramadi region of Iraq in 2006 and 7. He is now a practicing doctor of chiropractic and the author of Leave No Man Behind, the untold story of the Rangers' unrelenting search for Marcus Luttrell, the Navy SEAL lone survivor in Afghanistan. I sincerely want to welcome you to Adjusted Reality, Dr. Brooks. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Well, thank thank you for so much for having me. Of course, I would give you a few moments of my time. I love chiropractic. I love what you guys are doing. So thank you for having me. Fantastic. Well, you've started with so much energy, enthusiasm in life at the at the very young age of 21. So I want to really have the listeners, especially during this very special um, edition that really will engage our active duty military and our veterans because we absolutely appreciate them, respect them, and could not be more grateful for their participation in keeping our freedom alive. Life. So first, I want to start with the very beginning questions. You joined the army and you had your first deployment to Afghanistan. Can you kind of give us just a, an, an idea of what was the first deployment like? Yeah, so your first deployment and a lot of the veterans here are probably like, oh man, I have so many things to tell you about this. But your first deployment, you really don't know what to expect. You think you have this idea based on movies and video games and you know what the fellow men around you have told you so you have this picture going into it and when you get there it's nothing like you thought and i think that's true for everybody it's um it's not constant battle and and fighting like you would think and a lot of it is downtime and there's a lot of time to kind of sit in your own head and that's could be good can be bad right um, when I got to Afghanistan, I thought I was going to be thrown into the battle right away. And that didn't actually turn out to be true. As an army ranger, we're trained to, you know, take the fight to the enemy. We're always at the front. We're always fighting. But on this particular deployment, my deployment, it was slow and we trained a lot and we were getting ready for, but we didn't know what it was for, but we were getting ready for the battle ahead is what we were doing. You know, it's interesting because having read your book, and I think the book is absolutely um, just a great read, there is something about you that's very competitive. And I think you only become a ranger because you are competitive. And maybe you could just back up a little bit because obviously being a army ranger and knowing that you are at that place where everybody depends on your competitiveness to be strong, to be that person who is willing to relentlessly keep trying, go back just a little bit. Um, so you're, you're, um, you're starting your military life and, and maybe just tell us what actually made you dive deeper into wanting to be not just, you know, serving and, and there's no, not just, but there's, there's a level of commitment to going the next level. Tell me what drove you to that, to that spot where you knew 
I feel confident that I want to be a ranger. And I, I really did very much appreciate how you looked up to um, Tillman and what he stood for and how he made such a major difference in the men and women that were serving. So I'll start there. Tell me, what what was the initial concept of starting to go above and beyond? You know, it was, I think it was like the perfect scenario for, at least in my life. Um, a lot of bad things happened. 9-11 happened. Um, right after 9-11, I pretty much knew I was going to join the army. I had it in my head that I was going to do that. And a series of events happened that really kind of focused me on becoming a ranger. And one was obviously Pat Tillman. You mentioned it before. What he did, um, I think for our country and for young minds like myself is he showed us what a leader was. He said, this is what needs to be done and I'm going to go do it. Uh, it didn't matter that he turned down millions of dollars and fame. And um, he probably would have played a long time in the NFL. He was a, you know, very strong. He was rarely hurt and he was, everyone would looked up to him. Even NFL players did as well. So him, him going to become an army ranger made me definitely hone in on it. And also, believe it or not, there was a movie that came out right after 9-11 called Black Hawk Down. A lot of us have probably seen that movie. And that was just another, you know, check mark for, um, to her checking the boxes and telling me that that's what I needed to do. And I've always been competitive. I've always, you know, wanted to be the best at everything. Um, even to the point of little league, I would cry when I would strike out, I'd get so angry that, um, you know, I've always had that nature and my parents always tried to, you know, it's not just have fun, just have fun. No, I wanted to win. And I always wanted to win. Um, and that's sometimes a negative personality trait for some people, but for me, I used it to my advantage to say, if I want something, I can go get it. And, you know, having those leaders in front of me really just guided me there. I, thank you, Pat Tillman um, and his family, his, his brother. I actually served with his brother also. And what an amazing family they are. An amazing family they are, but you know, you have a, a younger brother and I'm sure that your competitiveness has only added years to his life and trying to be the best at, uh, at what that um, next step in their life will be. So I hope your brother is listening because I know that you have great respect for him too. And family is incredibly important. And I believe you have a, a sister younger than you. Is that accurate? That is correct. So the Brooke family uh, my... has a lot of, of really strong people in it. Yes, we were very competitive. And actually, to be perfectly honest, my brother was um, better than me at pretty much everything. So he, <laughs> See, that he would always really strong. <laughs> yeah. So really, I would be good at something and then he would find a way to become better. And a lot of it was because he was always playing against me. He wasn't playing against his friends. He was playing against his older brother, who was I was a pretty good athlete myself. So that drove him to be that much better. And you see that in sports families, actually. You see that all the time in the NFL. It's never the oldest kid that's their best player. It's usually like the second or third brother that comes along. I, I think as I look back and, you know, we we um, we did have uh, um, Ed Rogers and his son um, on with us. And, and one of the things is that a family of athletes is only competitive because it's just the way it's just what they know, right? It's, it's this, mm -hmm. this is a fun experience and it it's, you, they make it that way. You're probably one of those families that, it, you know, competition is part of the game. It's like rule one, do your best. If rule two win at all costs. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I'm seeing that even in my own son, you know, he's playing little league for the first time and I'm just telling him, have fun, have fun, do your best. And he's like, but dad, we lost dad we lost this game and they're two and one but that loss was like devastating for him I'm like oh my gosh he took that trait for me yeah yeah it's true <laughs> so so whenever I see a future little leaguer who's crying I'm gonna say see there is an absolute winner wait till that little boy grows up because we know that he takes the job seriously and that's what you did and in fact I think that's probably why um you wrote the book leave no man behind is you took what you did 
with every essence of your body. And now you have a legacy that you can share with others and share with active duty military and veterans. So what I want to ask you about is when you got to developing the book, first, maybe just telling our audience, what was the reason behind it? And then what can you tell us about the rescue mission at the end of your deployment? Yeah, so the book actually came about in a weird way. I've been thinking about it for years and years and years. You know, this event happened in 2005, and I just wrote the book in 2020. So it actually was the pandemic that brought me to write the book. Everything slowed down. I was thinking, okay, so the clinic is slowing down. My state is shutting down because I was in Washington state. And I was like, I just looking for things to do to take my mind off of uh, what was going on. And I said, you know, I'm going to start writing that book. And next thing I know, I was halfway through it. So it was really cathartic and it was a way to pass the time because obviously we couldn't do a lot at the time. Um, it was honestly, it was a lot looking at my kids and thinking, am I ever going to be able to tell them this story? Am I really ever going to be able to sit down and explain what I went through as a young adult? And the answer I came up with was no, I don't think I will ever be able to sit down and share this story in as much detail as I could in a book. So that's why I started writing it. So I had something to give to my kids um down the road and to my surprise my eight-year-old has already read it multiple times um, he found it around the house and he just started reading it and you know it's not really appropriate for an eight-year-old however <laughs> it's okay it is, it, it is his dad so at the same time you know what what's him learning it in a few years or now you know, rather discuss it with him as he grows and we did. And he asked questions about it. The stuff, a lot of stuff he didn't understand because it was over his head. But he loved it. He said, Dad, it was a really good book. I really liked it. <laughs> um, I have to agree with your eight-year-old because it's, it's very engaging in the details that you bring forth. And, and I say this as all respect to those that have been deployed or are, are deployed is telling your story is so incredible and and being able to share these feelings because one of the pieces that I think gets extraordinarily lost in translation is you come home from something that's so hard to even share and sometimes that's exactly what needs to happen is we don't understand as, as civilian life, what you've been through, what the training is, how hard it is, the ugly things, the, the, the horrific things and the endless nights that, that um, you're aware of your surroundings, but also knowing that today could be the day that could be the last day. And, and for those that do lose their life, making sure that their families, and you did such a beautiful job of talking about that in the book of knowing that if someone asked you to do something, if, if you didn't make it back, you would do it. You'd have the loyalty, trust, and integrity to follow through because you're, you're a brethren of warriors that will never leave a man behind. Mm -hmm. So now I want to take you to that next question is, tell us at the end, you had a, a fairly epic moment in your life. Can you share with our audience um, what happened to you and how um, that has basically changed your life? Yeah, so I had I'd gone through all my training as an Army Ranger. I was on my first deployment. And uh, at the end of our first deployment, we got put on a job that wasn't typical of Army Rangers. And it was called CSAR, or Combat Search and Rescue. And it was a mission that we, we understood and we knew what our job was. And our job was to help recover any downed aircraft or personnel should they go down in battle somewhere. And it's, it's not super common, um, but it's always, there's always someone assigned to that task should it come up. Um, and, you know, we didn't really ever think we were going to do it. We did train on it. We did do go through some specific tasks should it occur 
And lo and behold, right at the end of our first deployment, um, we were probably, I think we were about four weeks from leaving country. And one of our leaders ran into our room and stopped whatever we were doing. Some of us were playing video games. Some were reading books. Uh, there was someone watching watching TV. And he runs into the room. And the room went completely silent because it was obvious he had something important to say. And he said, a Chinook helicopter just went down. And immediately the whole room just went down an energy level that I, it's tough to explain. But everyone just got dead serious. We started putting on our gear and we embarked on is actually to date the largest rescue operation since Vietnam. And our job was to recover that down Chinook helicopter, which had 16 men on board, as well as help to locate a four man Navy SEAL team that had gone missing in combat. And I was a brand new army ranger at the time. I would, you know, I had only gone through training. I had no combat experience. This was my very first mission. At the time, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I thought it was just our job. Just do your job, right? But looking back on it, it was one of the harder missions you could possibly get as a new, as a new guy because no one in your group has experience on that type of mission. It doesn't happen that often. So they put us out within hours of that Chinook helicopter going down as close as they possibly could. Of course, carrying us in a Chinook on the way there to try and rescue everyone that was on the ground. We had no clue what we were getting into. You know, it was obviously very hostile. The weather at the time was monsoons. Anyone who's watching who's ever been in a monsoon understands how powerful those weather storms are. It's like, flying into a, a wall of water and you can't see a thing. So that's how I started my, my really my military career in Afghanistan. Wow. So here you are knowing that you're now search and rescue. You have literally 20 men to find and 16 of them being involved in the helicopter or the, the Chinook going down completely i mean you're at four weeks before before leaving this this is a monumental change in your reality this is now instead of the preparation for all of the things that you are active in in duty being watching and fighting for freedom now you're fighting to ensure that if there's four navy seals out there you can find them and hopefully find at least one man alive or woman. And uh, it's an incredible moment in your life. And it, it starts the, um, the competitiveness that we just talked about, which is you're angry. That would have to probably be the first feeling emotion and, and stop me if I'm incorrect. And now it's, it's, we're ready. We have to do what we have to do. So as you begin your, your, complete journey to finding these individuals. What was going through your head when you're on that Chinook um, moving towards finding these um, Navy SEALs and others? Yeah, obviously you actually hit it on the head. The first thing was real anger. How could anyone do this to us? How could anyone do this to America, right? We're, we're the toughest military in the world. And we win. That's just how it goes. Um, well, on that day, we lost. We lost a lot. So our job was to bounce back and make sure that at the end of the day, you know, we win the series and not just the game. And on our way to that, you know, recovery mission, I, I honestly, I didn't really know what to believe. I was just kind of one of the guys trying to do my job. But I looked around and I noticed all my leaders around me, how they were acting so different. And I fed off of it. I mean, they were, they were dead serious. There was no more joking. There was no more, none of the playful banter that we had back and forth. Usually um, they were just completely focused. And part of that was a little bit scary just because we always joke. And even though, even in the, in the, 
subsequent missions that I've been on in the Battle of Ramadi, you know, in the middle of a gunfight, some guy would make a joke. That's just how rangers operate. It's a way to keep us from, you know, getting too anxious or too, too far in emotionally. It brings us back down to calm us down. Well, at this moment, there was none of that. And some of the guys that were the biggest jokesters were just very serious and focused on the task at hand. So to me, that was scary because I'd never seen them like that. Um, but at the same time, it was also motivating, like, hey, look how serious he's being. So now I'm focused. So lead by example, right? I, and I that was it. it. That you was know, totally it. There We had on a guest um, that was really focused on on brain and intelligence, left and right brain. And his name is Dr. Chris Niebauer. It reminds me of going back and thinking through some of the um, emotional intelligence pieces. And, and this might be kind of a realization, or maybe you already knew this, but anger is a very primitive emotion. Oh, and yes. <laughs> um, underneath anger um, is fear. And fear typically turns into anger because it's the most primitive. And so here is where most men and women need to really engage in themselves and self-reflect is at that moment, you had the primitive, just absolute anger of losing a Chinook down and then having the fear of going into an unknown and, um, you know, um, highly volatile environment. So the fear is there too. So fear will lead back to anger. And it, it's almost like a melting pot for you of it builds up, it builds up and builds up. So I do understand why a ranger would joke in the, in the middle of a military fight, because, you know, joking is a very um, cathartic way to release a lot of the stress that happens in our daily life. And adjusted reality is just that, is we look at how the stress in our daily lives can be adjusted to be more levitated, to be lighter, to be more creative and use certain tactics to have a better life. And I, and I bring that to our audience because you're the man in the helicopter. You're the man that has to save lives hopefully you're the man that's search and rescue. So here you are with the first one that you've ever done, if I'm correct. And that's correct. This is your moment to bring back all of those little league. I'm not going to strike out. I want to hit that ball. I want to find and, and have some outcome that is better than what it is right now. Yeah, during that, I mean, if, if you read the book, you'll you'll probably catch the trend that I was always self-talking about that hope that we were going to succeed and it was all going to work out. And I was constantly, as I was going through this mission, I was constantly thinking, "Oh yeah, they're going to be. There's definitely going to be someone alive for sure. When we get there, there's going to be someone that's alive." And that that hope and that ability to not focus on the negative, like, "Oh man, this is going to be horrible." This is going to be ugly to, to go to that side of hope really drove us forward. So I think um, the way to take something that tragic and make it good is to infuse that hope. It what is. good can you get out of this horrible situation? There's always something good. You just got to find it. That is true. And you did a really nice job. And we're we're referring back to the book because you can get more information and it's quite interesting, you know, what Ranger stands for all the way through and talking about it, because it leads to how you could be optimistic in such a very devastating time. And what a ranger is, if you reflect on what a ranger is, or what is the active duty officer, what is that mission and how are they going to accomplish it? It brings it down to three words and hope is one of them. Faith that your team is ready, able, and capable of being able to maximize and accomplish the mission. That's step one. Hope that you can have that moment where you will find that survivor. And then at the end of the day, it's true love for what you do for your country and for the men and women that are side by side with you. And those, those three words 
cannot be understated in any way, shape, or form because it is faith, hope, and love that gets us through life. It is being able to have the ability to think in the way that you put it in the book. And it was the silver lining through so many things because you had no idea who was truly suffering while everybody is in this anger mode that they needed to hear your positive and they needed to know that we're all in this together. It's, it's basically the Pat Tillman story. This is what we're going to do because we have to do it. And I have faith that we're going to be able to achieve what we need to achieve. Hope that you'll come with me and love that we're doing this in the honor of the United States of America. Yeah, really, I mean, the the love part is really a big one. Uh, the big bad army ranger and me and the Navy SEALs and all the veterans listening, uh, we like to kind of hide from that uh, on occasion to, to seem tougher. But as we get older, all of us, you know, you show, you show a group of veterans at a party and we're all hugging each other, talking about how much we love each other, how much we miss each other. So... You know, we look at the the videos and the video games and the movies, and they're all real big, tough guys, right? Well, they're human. And that's what really my book was about, to kind of bring that out and say, hey, we're human too. And we love and we we cry and we do all the stuff that everyone else does. But we also can accomplish these great things under these horrible circumstances. And really, all of us can, anybody um, you get a, a mission that drives a group of people and nothing can stop them. Well said. You know, there's a lot of books out there that talk about um, life as um, an active duty military or some of the adventures that have happened. Like you mentioned, Black Hawk Down. Um, your book that that you portrayed the person with hope um what do you think they would get out of reading your book versus another book that is out there that focuses on um war and um recovery as someone who has to come back and then slide back into civilian life i think um i mean there's a lot of great war books out there and i read a lot of them i've read most of them they're wonderful i love them but I feel like there's a lot of common themes in war books where, you know, you go to battle, there's a tragedy, and then you all come out and you, we win, right? America wins at the end. And that's a great, I love those and I read them all the time. But I felt like my book, I really wanted to focus on what actually goes on inside of our heads when we're in these crazy situations. Not just what happened on the ground, but how about some some inner dialogue and really the, our thoughts on specific situations? And that's where I tried to focus on is more the humanity side of it and not just the war. The war is the context, but the humanity is the real purpose in, in my book. Well said. And you're right. As I was reading through it, and it didn't hit me till right now, is it really was like I was sitting beside you and you were just telling me, this is how I'm feeling right now. And as you read through the book, that's, you feel like I'm, I'm in your backpack or, or somewhere right beside you that I can kind of tap into those emotions. And, and if there is one thing and having last year during November, we had retired Brigadier General Becky Halstead is having to be with the men and women that have come back and move towards civilian life and there there oftentimes many moments of depression because it's not easy to try to help someone understand what you've been through and that sometimes we bottle it up and we package it and we say we never want to talk about it again and i i think that's one of the pieces that you do such a fabulous job of is i think i need to talk about this and i think more veterans need to talk about their experience is just to lay to rest some of the things that are in their current um, nightmares, in their current way of, of, of working through some of the post-traumatic stress that, that has come about. And, and I know that was one piece of the book that, that you did talk about is, you know, how did you feel having to be in these 
remarkable situations when, you know, you, you've, you have to be with the body bags. Can you just, I know this is a very, very difficult situation and I'm treading mm-hmm. on it as sensitively as I can be, but I think we have to be honest with those that are listening and many of them, which will be veterans, um, the sensitivity of the nature of what you had to go through. Yeah. I mean, it was an awful situation. And, and like I talked earlier is, during these awful situations, we as special operators tend to have dark humor. And you've probably heard about this. Um, people have probably mentioned it, but dark humor would be like, um, you're seeing the worst thing you've ever seen in your life and you make a joke about what it looks like. That would be some type of dark humor. And that's a way for your brain to try to process or to avoid processing that information at that moment right? It's a way to delay so you can continue doing what you're doing. Because ultimately, if you start thinking about how ugly the situation was, you'd shut down. And even the strongest of humans would do it. But having that ability to, as a group, you know, feed off of each other and joke and keep everyone moving forward is pretty incredible how it happens. And we see it in our first responders do it all every day. I mean, every single day they do it. Military does it every day. The average civilian may not do it every day, but you've done it. You've certainly done it. You've had a, some stressful situation and stressful to you, not necessarily to me or to somebody else. It doesn't really matter if I think a, an event is stressful, but if you think it's stressful, your body reacts the same way anyone would in a stressful situation. Absolutely. So. I, I found that one of the, for me at least, I, I went into these situations expecting much worse than what I ended up seeing. But my biggest thing that I wanted to leave every event that I was in was I need to make sure that everyone around me is okay. So I, I was very much focused on the people around me so that I didn't get stuck in my own head. I had to process this later. I had to write this book. I had to, you know, go to therapy after I left the military. This was all part of the process. So I'm not unique. I just went through the process. And I think any veteran, any human that's been through a stressful situation needs to understand that there is a process. And maybe it's not a step-by-step process, but there's a lot of things that have to happen to put trauma on the back burner. Mm. That's, that's a very deep comment because when you're in trauma, you don't recognize how deep it impacts you and you can look back at that trauma and there's the, should I, would I, could I moment, and you can torture yourself in that zone um, cause you always think back, could I've done something different? Could I have, you know, should I have done this? Could I have done that? So, so you got to get out of your head in that aspect of it. And then you have to live the trauma with almost like, if you think of the trauma as, um, a canvas and the trauma itself is not the pretty picture. It's what you're going to add around it. So you can identify it. You can dive deeper into it. And then you can explore how you're going to pull yourself out of it. And having spoke to some very um, fascinating Medal of Honor recipients that that have, um, like you, explored it and tried to help others through it, it's kind of that Mother Teresa moment do small things with great love. And while I'm saying not writing a book is a small thing by any stretch of the imagination, it's being able to think of others and how you can help them by the fact that you're helping yourself. And that's, that's a deeply profound moment. Yeah. And that, uh, honestly, that's the biggest thing I took away from writing my book is, you know, I did it for my children and for myself and Yes, I did it for the people I was with to make sure their story was told. But I had no idea how many people would be reaching out to me after saying, thank you so much for sharing that story. I need to talk to my family about what happened when I went overseas. And I hear it over and over and over again. 
thank you for showing me that it can be done. And I, I feel like if everyone just told their stories and talked to people and they're going to get, they're going to grow, they're going to grow from it and they're going to get rid of some of those thoughts. Like, could I have done this? Well, if you ask enough people, you may find out that no, no, I definitely wouldn't have thought of that. Well, that's, that's what your Monday money morning quarterbacks do, right? <laughs> yeah. They they talk about the play that should have happened the next day. That's real easy to do. But in the moment, not that easy. So true. And I really want to impress upon the beauty of them coming forward and and that it it may be your spouse, it may be a best friend, it may be a therapist, it may be a healthcare provider that you open up to at first, but just being able to walk through some of the things that you think are just, there's no way I ever want to revisit that, that moment that you revisit it, you might find that you see it just slightly different and it, it helps to levitate you to a different place. And sometimes having someone that you can talk to, which is why I think veterans are so tight uh, you want them to come mm -hmm. together. And I love how you put it in the book that you do anything. You could be years out but if if one of your men and women came to you and said, I need you now, it wouldn't even be a question. I love I love how you did the decathlon and I won't I won't I won't tell any of the the funny stories in your decathlon because they have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> part, part of it's just training, right? You have to train yep. with your troops. You you can't build a team that would lose their life for the other teammate without having the moments where you share and, and really start to care about them. No one's perfect. We all have our flaws and you do such a beautiful job of sharing it and how that, how that came to be. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to tease the listeners um, about the unicorn. <laughs> I think the unicorn makes the book that that much more fulfilling because it rounds everything out. It it rounds out the beginning, middle, and end. Why do we do it? Because there's a unicorn. Why do we need to win? Because there's a unicorn, and there's and always a unicorn. There <laughs> has to be a unicorn in every story. So, so having said that, um, you leave the military life you come back home and now you have to have a double down multi-purpose faith hope love profession a business a, a a next career move what what was that for you uh, this is interesting because there's i guarantee you there's veterans listening right now that this is going to be them they got out of the military you kind of knew you wanted to do something that helped people that's that was me I knew I wanted to help people. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I had this problem. I had pain everywhere. I beat myself up really badly when I was in the military and I could not find a solution. I tried physical therapy. It did help. I tried acupuncture and it did help. I tried uh, a psychic that didn't help, but it was fun. And I, you know, I went to therapy. I ended up in three orthopedic surgeons office from the top medical schools there in LA. So it was UCLA and USC. And I was in their office and they wanted to operate on me. And basically I had partially ruptured two discs. I had a couple of disc herniations in my lumbar spine and it just was not getting better. It was, I, I worked out constantly and it would flare it up and I'd be on my back for a week. So the surgeon said, there's only one option. There's surgery. Oh, there's another option, but you get an injection, then you have surgery. And I just didn't, at the time, it didn't feel right to me. It hurt and it bothered me every single day, but I knew there was something else. I knew it wasn't, that wasn't it. And my wife, the unicorn, of course. So I just gave away part of the story, but the unicorn said, you got to go see my chiropractor. And this is great. 
because I am a chiropractor now, so I can say this all day long. I said, I am not going to one of those quacks. And my, my wife looked at me and said, well, what do you mean quacks? I said, well, chiropractors are all quacks, right? And she goes, have you ever been to a chiropractor? No. Why would I go to a quack? And so she, she looked at me and she said, what makes them a quack? Just tell me. I just want to know what it is. I did not have an answer. I said, I just heard that when I was a kid and I still believe it. So really, I had this belief that was implanted in my head at some point in childhood in the 80s, go figure. And I thought they were quacks. And I still believed it, even though I had no evidence to support it, other than some anecdotal stories that I heard in the past. So I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. Even though I don't think he's going to be able to help me. So I gave him no hope. <laughs> and she sent me the chiropractor. And this guy, you know, he did his evaluation. And some of the stuff he did, I didn't quite understand. He took some x-rays. He did a couple orthopedic tests. He did a few other things. And I'm like, what the heck is this guy going to do for me? Lays me down on the table, adjusts me. And I get up and I say, huh. He goes, how do you feel? And I said, well, I still hurt. But I feel different. And I, I don't know what. I can't really explain it. And he said, okay, well, I'll see you in a couple days. And let me know how you do. And I come back. How you doing? I'm doing great. Um, and what are you feeling? And, he, and I told him, I said, you know what? I've been pretty productive the past couple of days, but I'm still hurting. Maybe a little bit better. I'm not quite sure. And he said, all right, let's check a look again. And he adjusts me again. And I'll admit, I did feel a difference that time. It's like, okay, I feel like I can move better. Um, but what really what was happening was, you know, even though the pain was slowly fading, right? I realized that, wow, I'm, my mind is clearer. I'm able to focus. I haven't been able to focus for, I was getting ready to go to USC to go to college. And I was having trouble uh, with my studies, just not able to focus on anything. And I just noticed that my body was changing. I couldn't really explain it. And this chiropractor said, you're doing amazing. Your body knows exactly what's happening. That's all that matters. He goes, I'm just going to keep helping you. And come a few months later, um, I'm feeling great. I'm starting to run again. I'm starting to lift weights again, heavily, heavily. And he goes, you know what? You'd make a great chiropractor. He goes, he said, you know what? You'd make a great chiropractor. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I'm like, you can go to chiropractic school. It's easy. All you got to do is get your degree at USC and then go to chiropractic <laughs> college after. It's I'm easy. like, how long does that take? And he said, oh, it's only about eight years of school. No big deal. <laughs> I'm like, what? Eight years? I don't know if I could do that. And he said, listen, you just told me you were an army ranger. You can go to eight years of school. Just go do it. You can change so many lives. And at that moment, I realized, oh, my God, what an awesome profession that could be. I just... I don't see people that are dying. You know, it's one thing to be a medical doctor and see people on the worst day of their life. We see that sometimes as chiropractors, but most of the time it's like just a bump in the road and they just need some guidance. Right. And that was me. And he could, he profoundly changed my life. Made me find this awesome career. I knew I wanted to help people. And this was the way it was with my hands. And ironically, um, on Operation Red Wings, I couldn't help any of those guys. They all died, right? But what did I do? I picked them up, I put them in their body bags, and I carried them to their family with my bare hands. And l looking back on it, it's like I was meant to do this. This is why I, I was meant to use these hands to help people. So that's my journey to chiropractic. There's so many, I know there's veterans out there right now that are struggling physically, mentally, emotionally. And I'll just tell you, uh, if you haven't been to a chiropractor, you, you need to go. You need to go bad. It's going to change your life. Uh, it certainly changed mine. It's incredible how when you were a young man, 
you heard something about chiropractic and it it surprises me that we hold on to these things that i mean it's just you don't know why it's just someone said this and this is the way it is and the quack title we had the legendary dr lou sportelli on the adjusted reality podcast and the contain and eliminate of chiropractic and how you actually got that word in your vocabulary as a young person is real. And there's a real reason why it happened. And unfortunately it takes approximately 50 to 70 years to eradicate um, false troops. And we see that so many um things in life, false truths come out. You don't realize I'm going to tell you something. It's not factual. It's not the truth, but you're going to, it's going to stick. It's going to stick hard. And listening to that contain and eliminate adjusted reality episode will open a lot of people's minds and hearts because your hands were for the good and you did use them to bring hope and love and faith to those that lost their life in battle and then bring them back after battle. And I know now you're treating a lot of veterans and you're putting your hands on them and you're bringing back that hope once again. And I think our, our listeners need to understand that it is this incredible moment in life where we reach out and we try something that we may not be comfortable trying, but you said it best, you know, I can be a ranger, so I think I can do this. And I, I really love that statement. Let, let us go with one thing here is, is that as a veteran or active duty personnel listening and that, that really are struggling with their, with their health, there are certain things that you do now that you probably wouldn't have before you came, became a chiropractor. And now you're in your office helping thousands of people on a regular basis and you're building a lifestyle for them. It's not just, I'm taking your pain away. It's I'm making your quality of life better. Like you wouldn't run if anybody paid you to run before you, and you first got back. It's like my back hurts really bad. I'll do whatever it takes to get out of this pain. If someone said, well, run, you'd be like, oh no, that's not going to happen. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but that chiropractor got you back to running, which is a quality of life measure for me as someone who loves to run. It's enormous because that's where I find my greatest peace is by zoning out and just my body is doing something that it loves and the endorphins and encephalons are kicking in all the happy things that we want out of today's, you know, the runner's high. Now you can do those things. So can you tell our listeners that may be struggling, what are some helpful things that they need to hear from you before you saw a chiropractor and now after when you treat them as a chiropractor and first responders, firefighters, police officers, we love all of you, paramedics, um, nurse practitioners, you're fabulous. And we couldn't do it without you, but what is it that is so particular about chiropractic now having seen it that really does change lives? You know, one of the things that sticks out to me is actually a patient that came in to me Gosh, it's been about a month now. And she was a, a gold star wife where her husband had died from suicide post deployment. So he took his own life post deployment. She came in five years after and she was sitting across from me and she was telling me everything that was wrong with her. And I was listening to her and let, writing everything down and taking my history and doing everything I needed to do is to be a good doctor. And then I, I got to a point where the list was getting so long of all the things that she thought was wrong with her body and her life and everything, right? So I stopped her and I said, you know what? I've got a great list of things that we can work on. I want to hear, tell me something awesome about your, about your life right now. Tell me one thing. And she sat and stared at me for like a good 10 seconds without saying a word. She goes, I, I don't know. 
I don't know anything. I have, I guess I have wonderful children. And no one had ever asked her what was good in life. They always talked about the things that were bad. So I flipped the script on her and I said, I got her to start thinking about the things that she loved. And I, I said, you know what? Let's, let's make a list of things that you love or that you used to love that you want to love again. And we started going through this list and she named a bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go through that list, but I said, now let's focus on getting you this stuff. All that stuff that wanted to go away. That's my job. I'll focus on that. But your body is going to do all the work. I'm just going to kind of guide you in the right direction. How does that sound? And she looked at me and she said, I, well, I thought you're the doctor. You're going to fix me. Said, nope. I'm not going to fix you. Your body knows exactly what's going on. It knows exactly how to get you where you need to go. Just needs a little bit of guidance or some interference removed. She goes, wow, no one's ever said that to me. That's really weird. I, I thought that there, everything was like, I thought my hormones were all messed up. And, and, I, and I explained to her that the interference that was causing those hormone problems was she was in constant fight or flight. She was sweating and it was 69 degrees, I think, in my office at the time. It was cold. I mean, my fingers were cold and she's sweating in front of me. And I said, Does it, is it hot in here? Is it really hot in here? And she said, no, no, it's actually kind of cold. And I was like, then you're, why are you sweating? She goes, I don't know. I think maybe I'm nervous or I'm anxious. I'm like, do you, you just told me you sweat a lot. Do you think that maybe you're nervous and anxious all the time? Like you're ready for a fight or you're ready to go for a run? She goes, yes, that's how I feel all the time. Well, I, I found that many veterans come in in that fight or flight response they're just sympathetic overload you know they are stressed out from every aspect of their life and all they really need is someone to point out all the good stuff that they need back in their life and chiropractic is the best way to do it i mean we are a holistic profession we look at your diet we talk about exercise we talk about being mindful when I mean, you talked about running right what did you say about running? Not that it was great for your heart and your muscles. You said that was your moment to what? Totally relax. At yes. Peace. Yeah. So that was more, it's more, that's what you get out of running. The exercise is just the bonus. And I think chiropractors are the best profession for getting people to realize how amazing their bodies are. And there's nothing wrong that maybe there's things that need a little bit of assistance because there's, a lot of things blocking its normal transmission, right? So for me, being in this profession and talking to patients, I would say, your body is more powerful than anyone's ever told you. Ever. You ever heard of the person that's cured their own cancer? The person that um, defied all odds and survived some crazy trauma? Yeah, we've all heard those stories. And why? Why does that? Why do some people have it and some people don't? Well, those people had less interference. Is what really what happened, and they had more brain power or more brain activity to heal their problems. That's it. That is the only thing that separates us. And gosh, I love this profession so much. So I would, I would say that anyone out there that's even debating whether or not they should go to a chiropractor needs to say, is there something that I could make better in my body? And if the answer is yes, then chiropractic is a good choice. Well said. And with that, I want to thank you sincerely for stepping in and stepping up. You started as a young competitive individual. You kept that going all the way through your life, but you've used your competitiveness to bring out the very best in so many. And I will tell you, leave no band behind book is that next step for so many is to be able to have the moment to share the stories, to know that there is faith, hope, and love that keeps us moving forward and not backwards. And for that lady that you just spoke about, it is being able to recognize that oftentimes we do need to just take a big breath in. It's just as simple as taking that big breath in and blowing it all the way out and recognizing that 
I'm actually alive today. And my adjusted reality is I can take a big breath and I can think about all the good things that are happening in my life. So on behalf of everybody at the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress, we want to thank you, Dr. Tony Brooks, for being able to share the story, share the adjusted reality that occurred in your life and will occur in many others after they hear this podcast. We appreciate you coming on and um, obviously look forward to, I'm sure there's another book in you that we'll be able to get out and uh, learn more from you as time goes on. Well, Yes, you are right. I'm currently working on a couple projects, but those are down the road. But thank you for having me. I appreciate being here and I, I am grateful to share this wonderful profession with you. I want to thank you for tuning in to Adjusted Reality as we spoke to author and chiropractor, Dr. Tony Brooks. Dr. Brooks shared a heavy story of training, pushing to be best and realized that he needed to be best mentally as well as physically to help others see the hope in the mission of search and recovery. And he continues that mission to this very day, giving thanks to the Pat Tillman family for their service and sacrifice because hope is now where he spends his entire day helping others find a solution to a better life as a chiropractor. This podcast was brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. As a special gift for listening today, visit f4cp.org slash health to get a copy of our Mind, Body, Spirit ebook, which focuses on many ways to optimize your health and the ones you love without the use of drugs or surgery. Don't forget to subscribe, share this podcast with family and friends, rate and review. If you're feeling inspired to learn more about chiropractic or to find a doctor of chiropractic near you, visit f4cp.org slash find a doctor. We appreciate your support and look forward to checking in with you again very soon.